Thank you. So I guess you read the, the news about the strike. That's uh, business as usual here. Uh, uh, so just one disclaimer to st before studying. Uh, I have two feet in academia. So what I will talk about is a vision of someone f in a university. So it might not reflect completely what's uh, happening uh, in the real world. Uh, when I was asked to give a presentation, I you know, went on this uh, topic of data privacy because it's something I'm working on right now. And uh, it's something that is very important if you think about the cloud. And then I saw in the program that there are actually a few presentations talking about security and privacy uh, in the cloud. So I ended up actually uh, deciding on talking uh, for a few minutes in general words about what is data privacy in the cloud especially focusing on public cloud, what you can do and or can, or cannot do in the public cloud, and focusing on data. So I'm not talking about computations, but really you, the data, you have some data, can you put it safely in a public cloud and can you do operations on it in a public cloud? And then I will spend, spend some time to talk a little bit about two uh, European projects uh, I'm involved in right now. So one is just completed and the, the, there's another one running right now, in which we are doing uh, actually data storage, data communication, data processing in the cloud. And I will show the kind of techniques we try to develop and apply to actually um, you know, go around the limitations of privacy in the cloud. So why do we want to use cloud computing? Um, I guess everybody knows it. I mean, you've been hearing that for uh, at least one complete day now. Uh, it's uh, it's an attractive paradigm because you can end up saving money. Essentially, uh, you have the economy of scale. Um, you share the infrastructure, you share the resources. The data is sitting somewhere in the cloud, so you can access the data from anywhere, from a mobile phone, from uh, work, from home. It's widely applicable to a wide range of problems. So you see all these acronyms, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, data as a service. I guess every letter of the alphabet, you can put it in the first place and you'd find a way to sell this as a service in the cloud. People are not actually very uh, agreeing on what exactly is the cloud. That's another debate, you know, find the right definition of what is the cloud. And uh, best of all, it's an affordable technology for small companies who don't have much uh, you know, man money or resources to operate on big data uh, quantities or doing big processing. You don't have to buy the machines, you don't have to get the engineers, you don't have to get the uh, technique in-house, the expertise in-house, you don't need the space to host the machines. So it's, it's great for small companies. But it's also tempting to attack the cloud. The reason is, you know, the cloud is essentially uh, accessible online and remotely, which means as an attacker, it's easy to sit in your basement with your computer uh, and try to connect uh, to remotely to public cloud and try to get in. And if you can get in, since the data by the service provider holds, uh, the, since, sorry, the um, service provider is holding the data from multiple companies, if you gain access to the service provider, then you get the data from multiple companies. And of course, data is important, data is power. You can get financial gains from selling the data. If we've, we've seen so many stories uh, in the news, you know, you, you, st you steal some, some data with the bank accounts from uh, people who try to evade uh, the, the uh, tax, whatever, and, and you can get lots of money out of this data. Uh, that's the result of a uh, uh, you know, widely publicized survey from Gartner a few years back asking uh, some companies what are the main concerns with public cloud. And by far, the top response was security and privacy. Companies are afraid of using the cloud because of security problems. And then the second one is performance. Performance is also a concern. People have the impression that you can, might not get at least predictable performance or good enough performance for, for your business. And of course, there are a few other concerns that are also relevant here. And if we look a little bit uh, deeper in what kind of security risk you have to deal with, uh, there are a few that are listed, uh, again, by this uh, Gartner report. Uh, so one of them is 
who has access to the data. So if some employees from the service provider can access your data, then essentially uh, your data is not private anymore. Uh, the compliance. The people who own the data is responsible for the data even if the data is not hosted on premises. So if I store my data on Amazon or Google, then I'm still liable for uh, the data if it's you know, stolen by someone. The location of the data is also important uh, in some countries, depending on what kind of data you have. You are not allowed to store the data on a remote country, on a foreign country. Uh, segreg segregation is another issue. You don't want the data to be mixed with data from other uh, people. Maybe your competitor is also storing the data on the same provider, and you might not want to uh, expose your data to in the same location. Uh, recovery, what happens if there's a failure, uh, what kind of guarantees do you get that the data can be recovered? Uh, inve investigative supports, if there is something, some fraudulent ac action taking place, what kind of tools do you have to really investigate uh, what happened? And of course, the viability in the long term. So you might want to trust uh, Amazon or Google because they, have, they are big companies with lots of money, but if you go to a small provider, what happens if it goes bankrupt? Essentially, your data is gone. So there are a few important concerns, you, you, uh, well, security risk, just by going to the cloud. So why do I focus on data and wh why is data so important? Because data is key asset for many businesses. Um, it used to be the case 10 years, 20 years ago, that uh, software was valuable, was making money. Nowadays, it's harder and harder to get money out of software. You have so, so, so much open source software around that is of very good quality. You make money out of services, you make money out of data. So data is really a key asset for businesses. And if you move the data off site, then you sort of lose some of your assets. It's a security risk. If someone can get your data and process it instead of you, then you lose your market. What do you need to do uh, with the data if you want to move to the cloud? First, you might want to store it backup service or uh, you know just to get enough uh, if you have lots of data then it might be more efficient to store it uh, you know in, in a central location that has enough disk enough memory and so on storing the data to protect it you use encryption that's the classical way of doing it it helps it's not completely a perfect solution because if you use encryption then uh, you have to trust the encryption techniques you are using. We've seen that there are flows in many encryption algorithms. You don't know in the long term what's going to happen because maybe it's safe today, but it might not be safe in two years or three years, or maybe it's not safe from NSA. Who knows? And then storing the data is fine, uh, but you really want to process the data uh, to, to do something useful with the data. One simple thing you might want to do is query the data. So you store big chunks of data in, uh, in the cloud. Then uh, if you want to search for instance, uh, all the data that relates to some activity of a customer. You need to f have a way to query the data. And if the data is encrypted, then it gets harder because the, the, the search, the querying, the querying is done in the cloud, which means you must find a way to run queries and encrypted data without revealing information to the provider. So there are some tasks that are possible, there are some algorithms that work, and we talk, I will talk a little bit about that later. And of course, the best would be to be able to do arbitrary processing of the data in the cloud. Again, encryption helps protect the data, but encryption is a problem if you want to process the data, because, well, you cannot do as much if data is encrypted than if it's not. Uh, and the known techniques, so there are some great techniques that are uh, developed by the research community, but they are not yet practical. What do you want to protect your data against? So there are different kinds of adversaries. Uh, whenever you think about security, you have to come up with an adversary and a model for this adversary. What kind of power does he have? Um, so there are two well-known adversaries here. One is the passive adversary. He's, he's just observing what's going on. He's observing messages, uh, packets, queries, and so on. And um, he can get gain information from this uh, seeing the activity. Or you can have an active uh, adversary, which may actually modify the data, tamper with the data, send uh, wrong results to queries, and so on. There are even 
more powerful adversaries. For instance, we can have adversaries that, that know the statistical distribution of the data. So even if the data is encrypted, by knowing, for instance, that some uh, terms, for instance, are much more frequent than others, typically if, if you have a Zipian distribution and you see something happening a lot, even if it's encrypted, you might be able to derive information out of that. The attacker can be a third party outside of your company, outside of the service provider, or it can be an insider. And insiders are very hard to cope with. So if you store your data uh, on Amazon or Google or a big company, you have to trust that the data is safe even from their own employees. And the problem is actually amplified by, all these problems are present in any kind of distributed system, but they are amplified by the cloud. And there is a great tutorial that was given at ICDE 2013 uh, that discusses all the kind of problems and solutions for uh, uh, you know, privacy in the cloud. Two things are important here. Uh, data confidentiality, you have to protect your data, but still be able to do something useful with it. And this is what I'm talking about today. And the other one is access privacy. So that's another uh, important thing. If you have data in the cloud, assume it's encrypted in a sm very smart way, uh, how can you retrieve an item from a server that is uh, under the control of someone else without revealing to this someone else what you are retrieving? Because if you reveal what you are retrieving, you're sort of giving information that is valuable. Uh, but this is something I will not uh, talk about today. So dealing with data confidentiality, the challenges we have is assuming that we use encryption, end-to-end -end encryption to protect the data, you still have, must be able to search the data. Otherwise, it's not much worth to store it in the cloud. Uh, you also want typically to do range queries. Maybe you don't want to have the complete set of uh, SQL operations on the data, but you need at least uh, to search and to do range queries. But you must know, not leak any information. You must protect yourself against various types of attacks, including statistical attacks, if you, the attacker knows the, some distribution of the, of the values, for instance. And there is a trade-off between, let's say, the functionality that you can uh, give to the, the, system, the, the clients or the system and the performance he gets, and the confidentiality and privacy. So the less confidentiality and privacy, the more sophisticated and performant tools you can provide. That's pretty obvious, I guess. So the tools we have to protect uh, your data, of course, the first one is encryption. That's the classical way of doing it. There are different kinds of encryption techniques. And again, depending on which encryption technique you, you use, you can have more sophisticated ways of processing the data. For instance, if you can use non-deterministic encryption. So if you encrypt the same things multiple times, it will produce different ciphertext. That's great, it's more uh, safe, more robust, but then you cannot easily search the data anymore. Uh, if you want to do range queries, you must have some sort of uh, order-preserving encryption because you must be able to compare things encrypted. Otherwise, you cannot uh, extract uh, ranges. But of course, it might leak a bit more of, uh, information. And there's something called homomorphic encryption. I will come back to that in the next slide. It's, uh, let's say, the, the new thing uh, in fashion nowadays for uh, uh, doing encrypted processing of data. There are other alternatives. I will not talk about them here. Uh, you can distribute the, the data in multiple places and make sure that uh, none of them is, is useful on its own. And there's something that is also ga gaining lots of uh, traction nowadays. It's uh, trusted computing. So you can rely on dedicated hardware to do the secure processing uh, of your data. So briefly on uh, homomorphic encryption. So it's, it's a way essentially what you do is you encrypt the data in a specific way and you can do computation on this encrypted data, on this ciphertext that will produce a result also in, as ciphertext. And if you decrypt the ciphertext of the result, then you'll get the result of the operation as if they would have been performed in the plain text. So you can essentially do various kinds of operations on the ciphertext that are producing encrypted results. So that's great. And actually the Graal here is fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, it was really uh, introduced 
in 2010, so it's, it's pretty recent. The idea is that you can do various types or arbitrary operations on encrypted data. Uh, by arbitrary functions, I mean you have additions, you have multiplications, you have binary operations, and by composing these low-level operations, then you can build any kind of high-level operation. So essentially, you can do anything you want. Great. So we, we can do it. The problem is performance. So this is a table I extracted from the paper uh, of the, the, the persons who introduced um, uh, homomorphic encryption, fully homomorphic encryption. And just to give you, uh, we probably cannot read all the details, but just to give you one idea. If I take this line, this line is a set of, let's say, sound parameters for doing something useful already. Uh, it takes to do, um, let me, okay. So you, you can do it. So this is generation of the key, encryption, decryption, addition, multiplication. To do an addition, it would be in the order of milliseconds. And to do a multiplication, it would be in the order of uh, tens to hundreds of milliseconds. For a modern computer, it's a lot of time. And just, figure, just imagine that you have a database of one million items. One million is not much for a database. We're talking about big data, so one million is nothing. If you want to do aggregation on these one million entries, meaning you have one addi addition per item, it would take something like uh, 15 or 16 minutes. If you want to do a range query, which means one multiplication per item, it would take in the order of uh, 10, 11 hours. So these numbers come from the paper and also from the tutorial uh, from ICD. So this just gives you a hint of why we cannot use fully homomorphic encryption for doing something useful nowadays, because it's just way too costly. Um, there's still a lot of activity around uh, this fully homomorphic encryption. There's uh, an initiative that was studied by IBM. They developed uh, an open source library called HELib. Uh, that provides a set of basic primitives in C++ for doing homomorphic encryption. And it's actively developed, and they have applied a set of uh, optimizations to slowly move to something that is more and more practical. Uh, they have a set of low-level uh, routines, and they, they are building high-level abstractions on top of it. But still, the numbers are not extremely good. It's still in the order of milliseconds for the addition, and. Uh, tens to hundreds of milliseconds for a multiplication. And uh, they, they show actually some results in which they have uh, evaluated something that looks similar to the AES-128 uh, circuit. And it took 36 hours, I think, to, to uh, run to evaluate that versus two milliseconds uh, if you use a, a clear text. So just to give you a, some order of magnitude, uh, it's, it's quite uh, slow. I think they have seen since improved the speed by, by a factor of, of 10 or even more. But seen, still, it's, it's uh, um, not practical. So I will now briefly talk about what we have been doing in the, the field of uh, data in the cloud and how to actually process and uh, uh, maintain privacy of the data in the cloud. And I will go over briefly over two uh, EU projects we've been involved in. In. So one is called SRT15, and the goal is really to use the cloud, the public cloud, to exchange data, exchange data between businesses that have their own private clouds. So it's a plat platform as a service. It's bridging different private clouds, and they're communicating in a sophisticated way across the public cloud. So we have techniques for doing content-based routing. So essentially, you need to process the data uh, you need to know enough of the data that is going through the public cloud to, do it, to, to be able to do decisions on which uh, person is interested in getting this data. I will come to, back to that later. And the other project is called Leads. And in Leads, what we are doing, we, we are storing and uh, processing data in the cloud. So it's a data as a service approach. And it's uh, combining both public data that doesn't need to be encrypted with private data that needs to be encrypted and protected. So this is the high-level uh, view of SRT15. So SRT15 was a project uh, coordinated by SAP. So SAP is also one of the major players in, uh, uh, let's say, the cloud uh, industry in Europe. So it's one of the only actually big players in, in, in Europe uh, uh, doing software as a service. And uh, what, we, what we worked on is a platform as a service in which you could do uh, content-based writing and complex event processing in 
the public cloud. And it's running on top of a combination of public and private clouds. So briefly speaking, uh, what we did was provide <coughs> content-based routing uh, in the public cloud. Content-based routing means that you want to send data from between, to exchange data between parties, but the identity of the person who will receive the data depends actually on the content of the data. So it's what we call also publish subscribe communication. Essentially, the data is events that are flowing between producers of data and going to consumers of data. And the consumers of data, they essentially register subscriptions or filters in the system. And the system is responsible for analyzing the content of the, the events and matching the events against the uh, subscriptions. And based on this matching operation, it will decide whether it sends the, the, the event to a subscriber or not. Which also means that some of the uh, processing logic needs to sit in the middle of the system in the public cloud. And this is uh, where actually the privacy problem uh, comes from. So you have in the middle some untrusted cloud. It's a public provider that has enough uh, capabilities for doing the processing, because processing is a costly operation, especially if you're talking about high throughput applications. And in green around, you have trusted clouds. So it can be multiple companies or uh, multiple branches of the same company that are uh, communicating with each other. And the, in the middle, you have the brokers, and the brokers are responsible for doing the matching and the filtering of events. So you might think that the data is not really sitting in the, private, in the public cloud because we just use the public cloud for communicating. But in fact, what you need to understand is in the middle here, you have all the subscriptions or all the filters from the subscribers. And this needs to be stored here in the middle. So you, you don't have the data itself, but you have the queries. A filter is nothing more than a query. And what you have here is not a database, it's sort of a reverse index or reverse database. And these subscriptions are sensitive information. So assume, so the, one of emblematic example of PubSub is the financial trading companies. So you have information like uh, stock quotes or uh, uh, offers for selling or, uh, or buying stocks. And as a subscriber, you would register um, filters for various kind of stocks. Let's say I want to be notified if the stock of Google goes below some threshold because then I want to sell everything. So this is sensitive information because if someone can see what I'm interested in, they can know what is my portfolio and they can derive, uh, they can know my strategy. So even if the data itself is not sensitive, then the queries might be sensitive. So we must enforce uh, confidentiality, integrity, and authentication, uh, authenticity in the public cloud. So obviously, we use end-to-end uh, -end encryption for confidentiality and integrity. We also have a key management uh, mechanism, because when you have to uh, communicate between producers of information and consumers of information, then if you use encryption, you need to share a key so that uh, the subscribers can decrypt what is uh, sent by the publishers. But it might be that at some point, uh, some subscribers and consumer has to be excluded from the allowed recipient. Then you need to change the key and generate a new group key. So we have mechanisms for uh, group key management here. And the clouds themselves, we assume that they have a similar level of trust if they communicate with each other. The contradiction we have is we have encryption, so we encrypt the data. We also encrypt the subscriptions because, as I mentioned, they have uh, their sensitive information. So the contradiction is how can you filter encrypted data using encrypted subscription? And this is where we need sophisticated techniques for doing this matching. That's, again, the high-level picture, but we see the flow of data in the system here. So the <laughs> publisher here is sending data that goes through the untrusted public cloud. Here, it's routed through some path, and then it goes to the subscribers. 
you have encryption here, you have decryption here, and this route is actually determined by applying encrypted filters on encrypted data. So what we do is we encrypt the filters and the subscription using uh, some encryption techniques. We produce an encrypted version of the uh, event, encrypted version of the subscription. These encryption algorithms, they use a shared key. It's not reversible, so you cannot obtain the plain text from the, uh, uh, the encrypted version of it. So we, we don't encrypt the actual well, we encrypt the actual content, but we also derive some information that will be used for the routing, and this information is not the complete content, it's only part of the content. And the key here is that you can check if an encrypted subscription will match an encrypted filter using some, some algorithm, and this test will return true if the original event will match the original subscription. You might have some false positive, but you never have, have false negative. So if the, if the encrypted test says yes, it matches, then it might be that in the end it doesn't match. But that's okay because the subscriber can still discard a message that it receives and you know, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not interesting for him. So we allow some false positives, but we never allow false negatives. So what you expect from these techniques is that uh, the operator can quickly determine if an event matches the subscription, or vice versa. But it cannot obtain the clear text value of either the message or the subscription. And it cannot generate fake subscription to, do, uh, to profile an event. If it could do that, if it could generate fake subscriptions, encrypted subscription, then it could you know, generate a lot of them. And by just doing the matching operation, infer what is the event. And vice versa, if you uh, generate fi fake events to profile subscriptions. So we, we have to disallow that. And just in one slide, the technique we're using is uh, called ASPE. So it's, uh, it was proposed uh, a few years back. It's based on a, a scal scalar product preserving transformation. And it, it comes from a very nice technique that origins, originates from databases. Uh, it was published in Sigma 2009. It's a technique for doing secure uh, k-nearest neighbor computation on encrypted databases. So this is a really nice technique. And uh, what it does is it will project the events and the subscription in a multi-dimensional uh, dimensional space. And it, they are, these points, they are encrypted in such a way that the scalar products are preserved. And then you can compare for inequality. But you cannot actually recover the distance between the points. And that's uh, provably uh, safe and for various type of, uh, against various type of attacks. The bad news is you have computational complexity. It's, uh, it's uh, linear. Uh, it's O of n per constraint. And n is the number of fields you have in, a, in an event. And worse, the space complexity is quadratic. So that's pretty bad news, because it doesn't scale very well. So we did some, some tests you know, to see how uh, scalability was uh, with this technique. And depending on how many constraints you have, you see that this is uh, clear text matching. It's pretty linear. And here, this is going uh, exponentially. Great. So it's something that really doesn't uh, scale beyond a given number of uh, constraints or a given size. So what we did essentially to address this issue is we added some more uh, technique to uh, the system. We add some stage that will, uh, it's based on a simpler technique uh, using Bloom filters in which we embed some information in the messages and the subscription that allows us to do very quick uh, discarding of a large range of the events that we know will not match a given uh, subscription. So I, I won't go into the details, but it allows us to save a lot of time because we don't have to apply this costly uh, encrypted matching operation on all the messages or all the uh, subscription, but only on a small subset of them. And actually, um, we, we did some privacy analysis. And despite the fact that these techniques are much more basic and, and uh, less secure, we still have a pretty decent privacy uh, level because the probability that you can derive information from our Bloom filters, if you have a Bloom filter of 
let's say 100, uh, 1024 bits, it's, uh, it's below 10 to the six, uh, minus 6, even if you have uh, nine uh, constraint resolutions. So it's, it's pretty safe. But of course, it's not as good as uh, using the plain encrypted matching technique. And finally, uh, we have one last component, is how you do the key uh, exchange between the different private clouds, because we need to have group, group key management. So we have added a, a secure group key management scheme on top of it, with a coordinator and some managers for subscribers and publishers. And one of the neat uh, uh, technique we have in this system is if you change the key, so assume that you have millions of subscriptions sitting in the public cloud. You have to change the encryption key. One way would be to uh, unregister all the subscriptions and re-register them with a new key. But that would be way too expensive. So we have uh, found actually a way to do the update of the encrypted subscription without having to delete them and add them. It's just a matrix transformation that will move from one encryption to the new encryption, or one key to the new key. And that way, this operation can be done simply by the brokers without them being uh, able to gain any kind of information. So that's uh, quite efficient in practice. I will need another five minutes. We started a bit late. I will talk very briefly of the second project we've been, we are involved in. So it's probably still running. It's, uh, pretty, it's halfway through uh, its duration. And here it comes from the observation that there, there's a lot of uh, public data available out there. So there's uh, the web, there's um, Twitter, uh, all information that comes from social uh, networks and so on that is interesting from a business perspective. But only the large companies like Google, uh, Apple, Facebook, and so on, they, they have enough resources to actually crawl these uh, networks uh, to store the data and to query it. So if you, if you want to exploit this huge amount of data, then you need to have enough resources, enough money. Smaller companies essentially cannot uh, enter the business easily. Data is power. If you have data, then you have uh, some very good assets because you can exploit it in lots of smart ways. So for instance, uh, if you are a small company and you want to uh, you know, analyze the web graph to extract business intelligence, like who are the sites who are uh, positively talking about you? You need somehow to extract this data from somewhere. If you want at some point to match some of your private data, like your, uh, your sales, sales data against something that is public, like the, uh, the popularity of some of your products, then it's hard to do because you have to get the popularity from somewhere and you have to match it against private data, but you don't want to give this private data to other people because you don't want to reveal your sales to a third party company. Or if you want to monitor in real time what is the evolution of your products. Let's say a product suddenly has received uh, very good press, and then uh, so there's a spike in popularity, and at a little point, then it gets uh, there's some bad news happening, or uh, I don't know, whatever person you have hired to promote your product does uh, something bad, and uh, uh, you might get uh, you know, a, a loss of popularity. So you, if you want to monitor these dynamics, then uh, it's not obvious to do it if you're a small company. Or even if you want to produce some new service like doing uh, sentiment analysis. Doing sentiment analysis, you might have the great algorithms for doing the analysis, but you still need to get the data. So these little companies, usually they don't have the capacity to do the crawling, the storing, and the processing of the uh, data in-house. So what we try to address in this project is to build on this uh, principle of economies of scales to have uh, small companies actually rely on some sort of abstract big company that would store, process, and uh, acquire and gather in the first place the data for them. So you, you, you could think that it's, it's easy to go to knock on, on Google's door and say, please uh, give me your data. The thing is, 
if you want to get the data from a big company, then uh, the big company must make sure that you're not uh, entering in the same business as the, they are. So it, the, the, it might not be obvious. I, I don't know the, the details because I'm not, you might want to, to ask uh, Peter, maybe he knows better, but there are, I guess, some sensitive, sensitive uh, domains in which you cannot really uh, enter by exploiting the data from Google because it will be uh, a threat for their own business. And you have no guarantees that the data you get is fresh, is uh, comprehensive. And of course, if you want to merge this data or combine this data with your own private data, like your sales figures, then uh, there's a security or trust problem here. So the idea is that we want to actually build a big uh, data as a service infrastructure that comes from the mutualization of the resources of many small companies providing open access to the, uh, to the public data and allowing small companies to actually also store their own private data and match it against the public data in an encrypted uh, manner. So that's actually the design we have in, in uh, Leeds. It's a data service. It will collect, store, and query the data here on behalf of small companies. What you want to do is you want to have uh, efficient collection of the data. You want to be able to attach private data to public data. And uh, private, private, uh, private data is protected by encryption. So we also need techniques for doing the processing of encrypted data in the cloud. We want to store multiple versions of each uh, data item. For instance, if we crawl the web, we want to have historical versions that way we can see the evolution or the trends. And we have a querying uh, interfaces that allows us to have either traditional one-shot queries, for instance, con check all the pages that talk in, uh, good, in a good way about our latest products, or we can have stream-oriented queries, for instance, monitor this product and see how uh, the, the reviews are evolving over time. Do we get more positive or more negative feedback over time? And private data, they are, uh, private data is protected by encrypted uh, techniques, encryption techniques. So we have sort of a library of operators that we can apply. It's not using uh, homomorphic encryption, but it's a library of operators that we can apply on encrypted data in the system. So I'm running out of time. Um, I will just show a typical query, and I will finish here. Typical query would be you gather the data from the web, and this data is constructing some sort of uh, data structure. This here, it's, it's an example of a web graph with multiple versions, which means that uh, as you crawl again, there might be some links that change, and you can monitor changes. This will be used by uh, continuous queries. Continuous queries will register listeners on specific type of data, and will construct a, a view that will be used then for doing one-shot queries. So you can have one-shot queries running on this view that is maintained continuously by continuous queries. So going to the end, um, just to summarize, I guess you're all convinced that the cloud is attractive for many reasons. We've talked about them, simplicity, availability, cost, uh, economies of scale, performance, and so on. It's great for computation if you have non-sensitive data because you can just buy machines, rent cycles, and pay for a few cents, a few cycles of, uh, or a few hundred millions of cycles of a machine. But then uh, when it comes to data, it's not obvious because it's, a, it's an attractive target also for attacks. Data is power, you must protect it somehow. And you cannot only rely on encryption because encryption will limit what you can do with the data. You cannot do as much uh, in terms of querying, in terms of processing. You have techniques like homomorphic encryption that are very powerful, but they are slow nowadays. And you never know how encryption will be uh, in the long term. So maybe it's safe today, but when you have quantum computers, then who knows? So if, if, if the data must be safe also in 10 or 20 years, I wouldn't probably trust encryption. So moving forward, there are several uh, essential concerns for the ad adoption of, let's say, public cloud services, and this is something we can argue uh, uh, about. I guess uh, Peter, uh, I missed his talk, but he has some strong opinion uh, about that. And uh, actually, I reused the title of 
his talk here, but apparently I missed the second slide that was more, uh, uh, that has the real, real title. Uh, problems are security. You need something that is provably secure. You need to understand math. You need to do, understand crypto and so on. But it still needs to be performant because if you are if you are safe, but it's less performant than what you get by using fewer machines that you host internally, then it's not worth. So it needs security and performance. And then, of course, it needs cost. So it needs to be significantly cheaper than if you had the machines in in uh, your premises. And then there's one last point I want to mention, and it will be the, the end of the talk. Uh, energy is also a big issue, I guess, especially for, I mean, in terms of cost, of course, you save energy, you save money, but also in terms of uh, visibility and press. So when you, have, you build a new data center and it's uh, uh, unvi uh, it's friendly for the environment, sorry, uh, then, uh, of course, it's, it's better for the image of the company. And we are working on one more proje uh, project I didn't talk about, it's called Paradigm in which we are uh, trying to build data, not data centers, but let's say, let's say uh, uh, clusters or big clusters uh, such that we can minimize uh, energy consumption from computations. And I think this is some, somewhere where we need to put more research and more money in because this is getting a big concern as we have more and more data centers being constructed and placed all around the world. Thank you. Questions? Do you have questions? Hi there. Can you comment briefly on what you think uh, things like uh, Intel's SGX technology and trusted hardware platforms might bring in the space? I read about it, I never, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I, I think this will be one of the uh, major ways we can actually change things. Because we can have, assuming that you trust, uh, my, my biggest concern is, you know, it's, it's a magic box. You know that whatever runs inside is supposed to be safe. Uh, you have to trust that it's really safe. You have to trust that there is no agreement with, uh, between Intel and NSA, there is no backdoor in the system that might actually uh, leak information that shouldn't be leaked. But if it's provably safe and I can trust the hardware, I think that's a very good way of doing uh, operations uh, in a secure way because essentially you're running almost full speed. But I think I read some, some news uh, about some, some researchers already trying to attack the system and finding maybe not uh, real problems but some, some possible uh, vectors of attack on these de devices. So I wouldn't use them nowadays. I would probably wait for some time until I can retrust really the hardware. But I really think that's great. That's probably the way to go. Th thanks, Pascal, for, for your talk. I've got a question on, on your very early slide, which has uh, disappeared, but where you showed a very long processing time for homomorphic operations. And, and uh, my question is whether this was considering a, a sequential approach where you would uh, look at each record one after the other, or if there was some kind of a naive parallel model behind uh, those uh, computations, which I understand are estimations and back of the envelope. To be truly honest, I would need to check back in, in the paper. Uh, I, I think it was you know, sequential, I, I would guess, but uh, I cannot swear. I, I need to go back in the, in, in the paper. So I, I'm not, let's say I'm not a crypto expert, so I, I went briefly through the paper and took the numbers because I, I think they are interesting as a uh, order of magnitude. But if you, if you go parallel, of course, these are operations you can pretty easily uh, parallelize. So you can, of course, if you have enough resources, then you can, but it requires lots of resources then. Right, one okay. last question, thank you, Peter. I'm curious as to what you think is a realistic threat model that people should be worrying about um, in terms of you know, how much functionality should be given up to pr protect against which threats because you know, the, I agree there are concerns but, and, and obviously people will be concerned about my employers yeah. but there is this fundamental thing of if we assume the quantum computers are going to break encryption yeah. one day 
then you have to estimate when and how much you care about that. Because if you really think that even if it was 50 years from now and they finally broke it and about the same time they learn how to read EEGs remotely without actually putting probes on your head or whatever, it, there comes a point where we have to say, okay, I don't care. I'll, I'll do my work anyway and that problem can solve itself in the future. So what, what is a realistic threat model that you think we should be worrying about? Well, I, I had this disclaimer saying I'm from academia and I'm not supposed to... to, to uh, the, the thing is, most probably the data you have nowadays, uh, in, in 10 years, it will be worth nothing anyway, because uh, most of the data is not for the long term. I, I guess if you are a company, you want to protect your data uh, or your, your assets as much as you can. And if the data doesn't leave the company, whether you use encryption or not, you're safe in any way. Of course, you have your own employees. Absolutely not, because you have rogue employees, you have people hacking into your own systems, you have the authorities turning up with a warrant. There are lots of threats that apply, even if the stuff never leaves your building. Yeah. But you're talking like someone who knows about technology, but someone, who, the, the people who are actually taking this kind of business decisions that probably don't know much about uh, or they don't know as much about technology. So for them, having, using a, an external company is already an added security risk. So I, I cannot quantify this, unfortunately. I, again, I'm, I'm from academia and I'm not supposed to take or to discuss about these kind of decisions, but uh, I would guess, you know, one of the most basic type of attack you can have is if you send your data to a third party company like a cloud provider, then you don't want the employees of, of this company to observe your data because they are not under your control. So you cannot fire them. So unless there is a real contractual uh, obligation between the company and the provider that says if uh, there's any leak, then I pay you uh, one billion, it would be hard to sell. All right, so that sounds like a great topic for discussion at lunch. So let's thank Pascal again. <laughs> Sorry.